So mark the sections on each of the poles and zeros on the right hand side. So you have a zero here. So I have marked a section just on the right hand side of this particular zero. Similarly, section two is also found on uh, the right hand side of this particular zero. So as section three and so as section four. And compulsory, you will have to select a section at minus infinity. All right. Once that is done, uh, you can start with the first root. For example, over here, we have our first root as a zero. So cover this zero and count how many poles and zeros are lying on right hand side of um, this particular section. So you don't find any poles and zeros, right? So the count is zero and zero is considered as an even number. So whenever you have an even number, you would say that there is no root locus. Okay. It's an inspection method. And then you can move on to the next root, which is a pole found at origin. You mark or mask this pole, okay, cover this pole and count how many roots are lying on right hand side of section two. Okay, only one root, right? Because that's a zero. So one root means count is odd. So whenever you get odd count, you would say that uh, there is a root locus. Okay, only this is the change what I wanted to point out in rule number three. So you will get alternate sections of NRL and RL. RL means root locus. NRL means no root locus. Okay. So that is the one correction what I wanted to uh, tell you. Okay. Fine. Today let us uh, look at um, the actual root locus problems. Okay. So first let us start with a simple problem. And then we can uh, slowly raise the complexity. So let's start with uh, yeah, say suppose this. Okay. Take down the question. Draw the root locus for draw the root locus for g of s into h of s is equal to k into s plus two into s plus three divided by s into s plus one. So this is the problem and you are supposed to draw the root locus for this particular problem. So such problems normally comes for 8 to 10 marks. All right. Fine. And in gate, uh, it comes for uh, normally 2 to 3 marks. Okay. All right. Fine. So let's start with the problem. So root locus is... Uh, uh, you know, systematically you are supposed to tackle root locus problems. In the sense you are supposed to discuss about each and every root, okay, because the question going to be descriptive in your examination. So let us start with rule number one, okay. So those who haven't watched the video, you know, for them it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, understand the different rules which are used in root locus construction. Rule one, rule one says root locus is always symmetrical. Symmetrical about real axis. So that's your rule number one. Symmetrical about real axis in the sense uh, the mirror image uh, lies in uh, third and fourth quadrant. So whatever you find in first and second quadrant. Uh, its mirror image going to be there in third and fourth quadrant. So that's about the symmetry. Rule two. Okay. So rule two is about uh, open loop poles and open loop zeros. Okay. 
So P is equal to open loop poles and Z is equal to open loop zeros. Okay. So the given open loop transfer function is consisting of how many open loop poles? Two open loop poles, right? One is at zero and one more is at minus one. So open loop pole count is two. And you look at the numerator. Okay. So in the numerator, you have two factors. That means to say you have two zeros. So zero count is also two. Okay. So P is equal to two and Z is equal to two. So whenever we have, okay, when your count P is equal to Z, you would say that N is equal to P and which is equal to 2. Okay. So where N is nothing but where N is equal to uh, number of root locus branches. Number of root locus branches. Okay. So that means to say uh, there will be uh, two root locus branches. All right. All right. And two branches. Starts from that is right, two branches starts from poles and terminates at the zeros. Okay, that's because poles are called as starting points. And zeros are called as terminating points. Terminating points. So there are two starting points. So two branches will emerge out from the poles. And there are two sink points or terminating points. So all the two branches should terminate at the available zeros. All right. So that is about rule number two. You will understand uh, when we construct the root problems. All right. Uh, next, you have rule three. Rule three. Okay. So, rule three is about existence of root locus on real axis. So, heading is existence of root locus on real axis. Real axis. Now, for rule 3, what you have to do is you have to draw the pole 0 plot. Okay, pole, pole 0 plot. Um, fine, let us do the pole 0 plot. So, poles, first let us look at. You have a pole at origin and you have a pole at uh, S is equal to minus 1. So, what you have to do is you have to equate the denominator polynomial to 0. Okay, so when you equate the denominator to 0, what do you get? The roots of the denominator. S is equal to 0 and S is equal to minus 1. So S is equal to 0 and S is equal to minus 1. So that is your uh, pole location. And now what you do, you equate your denominator, sorry, numerator to 0. Uh, when you equate your numerator to 0, uh, you would get roots of the numerator, which is called as zeros of the uh, transfer function. So you have a 0 at minus 2. And you have a 0 at uh, minus 3. So 0 at minus 2 and 0 at minus 3. All right. So you are done with the pole 0 plot. Once you are done with the pole 0 pl plot, what you have to do is you have to select uh, small sections on uh, basically the uh, right hand side. Okay. 
So select a small section here. And select a small section here. Here and here. Okay, just on the right hand side. So this is section one, section two, section three, and section four. Okay. After marking these sections, what you have to do is you have to uh, consider the individual roots and start counting how many open loop poles and uh, open loop zeros are present on right hand side of a particular section. So let us start with the first pole, okay, and check how many roots are lying on right hand side of uh, this particular section. Zero roots, right? So zero is an even number. So whenever you get your count as even, uh, you would say there is no root locus. So your entire positive real axis is uh, no root locus zone. All right. And now you can pay your attention to the second root, which is essentially a pole. And cover this pole, okay, like this, you cover. And count how many roots are lying on right-hand side of section 2. How many roots? Only one root, right? So 1 is an odd number. So when you get an odd number, you would say there exists a root locus. So between minus 1 and origin, there exists a root locus. Uh, done. The third root you consider, which is essentially a zero, cover that root and count how many poles and zeros are lying on uh, the right hand side of section three. You have two poles. So count is even, hence between minus two and minus one, no root locus. So you can write. NR. Okay. And what happens to the at the fourth section? The count becomes one, two, three. That's an odd number. So whenever you have an odd number, you will have the root locus branch. Okay. Then as I said in the beginning, that you have to consider compulsorily you will, you will have to consider a section at negative infinity. Okay. So this is going to be your fifth section and taking negative infinity as your reference uh, you count uh, how many poles and zeros are lying on the right hand side of section 5 1 2 3 4 4 is a e even number so whenever you have an even number you would say there is no root locus root locus okay so just to uh, show clearly uh, the RL section from NRL section, what you can do is you can uh, thicken the root locus section. So, for example, between 0 and minus 1, there is a root locus section. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a thick line. Okay. Similarly, uh, there is a root locus between minus 2 and minus 3. So, this also I'm going to draw with a thick line. Okay. All right. So, that's about your rule 3. Okay. So rule three helps in uh, validating the breakaway points. All right. I hope you are doing it simultaneously. All right. Once you are done with rule three, you can go for rule four. So rule four is all about uh, calculation of centroid and angle of asymptotes. So rule four is about centroid. Centroid, all right. So how will you find the centroid? Centroid is denoted by sigma, okay. And sigma is summation of real parts of holes minus summation of real parts of zeros divided by p minus z p minus z okay so basically what happens over here is that um, sigma okay 
sigma is equal to real parts of poles. Um, you have real part of first root as zero, okay, plus real part of second root as minus one. Because when you equate this to zero, you will get zero comma minus one. Similarly, when you equate the roots, I mean the numerator polyne, you will get yes is equal to uh, minus two comma minus three. Okay, minus uh, real part of zeros. Okay, what is real part of first factor is minus two, and real part real part of second factor is minus three. Divided by p minus z, which is essentially zero, right? Which is essentially zero. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, centroid for this particular problem, you know, doesn't exist because um, you will have something like two minus three e minus five minus five uh, into minus one plus five. Okay. So basically, and that is divided by zero. So basically, uh, centroid. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. It's a very interesting problem in which you will not have any centroid. If you don't have any centroid, uh, then you will not be able to, uh, you know, draw the asymptotes basically. So you will get a kind of peculiar asymptotes here. Okay. So that let us check in rule number five because rule number five talks about uh, angle of asymptotes. Angle of asymptotes. Okay, so angle of asymptotes is uh, found using the formula theta is equal to two q plus one into one eighty degree divided by uh, p minus uh, uh, z. Minus L. So what do you get? Uh, you get P minus Z is equal to zero, right? Because open loop poles are two and open loop uh, zeros are also two. So two minus two is zero. So you can say that theta doesn't exist. Theta doesn't exist. Okay. Now what do you mean by this? Theta doesn't exist. So that means to say there are no asymptotes actually. Okay, you cannot determine the asymptotes. Now, what are asymptotes? Uh, in the previous class, I have given a definition for asymptotes. Asymptotes are uh, uh, the guidelines for the branches of the root locus which are moving towards infinity. All right. Now, you cannot determine the asymptotes. That means to say that that this particular problem may not have any branches which are moving towards infinity. You will eventually, uh, you will come to know about it, okay. So you cannot determine asymptotes because anything by zero becomes uh, infinity, right? So asymptotes doesn't exist. So as the centroid, okay. So that means to say you will not have any uh, root locus branches moving towards infinity. Okay, that is the key takeaway from rule number four and rule number five. With it related to this particular problem, all right, which is good, right? No asymptotes and no centroid. So quickly you can draw your root of this. Fine. Next you have rule six. Okay, rule six is something about breakaway point. Breakaway. Uh, lethargic procedure you are supposed to follow. Now, how do you find, find breakaway point? Step one is to find f of s. What is f of s? f of s is 1 plus g of s into h of s, which is equal to 1 plus uh, g of s into h of s is already given. So, k into s plus 2 into s plus 3 divided by s into s plus 1. Uh, which is equal to zero because characteristic equation is always equated to zero in order to get the roots of the characteristic equation. Okay, simplify and tell me what you get uh, f of s s. So basically, s square plus s, and you have to open up uh, the brackets here. Okay, 
So when you take out the LCM, you would get S into S plus 1, right? Um, plus K into, I will open up this, S squared plus Y S plus 6 is equal to 0, or F of S is equal to um, S squared plus S plus K S squared um, plus 5K S plus 6K is equal to 0. So this is my F of S. This is my F of S. Once I have my F of S, what I can do is uh, I have to uh, write my, sorry, rearrange my characteristic equation in such a way that I get something like K is equal to some function of S. So all the K terms, you have to keep it on one side. And yes terms, you have to keep it on the other side. That's what you are supposed to do. OK, so how do you do it? Uh, you can extract k terms. Uh, OK, you can extract k terms uh, from this particular equation. So what you can do is you can first rewrite this particular characteristic equation. OK, so let me write it. A square plus yes plus k square plus 5ks plus 6k is equal to 0. So I have rewritten the characteristic equation. And what I will do, I will keep uh, k terms on one side and s terms on the other. So let me first mark the k terms. I have k square, 5ks, and 6k, uh, from which I will take out the k. Okay. So if I keep k outside the bracket, what do I get? I get a quadratic equation, s square plus 5s plus 6 is equal to the terms which are independent of k are taken on the right hand side. So I will get minus of um, s square uh, plus yes. Okay. Or, or k is equal to k is equal to um, minus s square plus yes divided by the quadratic equation s square plus 5s plus 6. Okay, so this is my function of k, right? This is what I was referring to, right? You have to get an equation, something like k is equal to function of yes. So you have k on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have uh, the function of yes. So this is what you are supposed to find. Once you find an expression for k, you are supposed to differentiate that particular expression. Okay, so step number two. Okay, step number three actually. So this is your step two that is obtaining uh, k is equal to f of s. So in rule 6, uh, the third step is differentiating k with respect to s and equating to 0. Okay. So that implies you have to use uv rule here. So denominator square, square plus 5s plus 6, the whole square, divided by um, s square plus 5s plus 6 into uh, differentiation of the numerator, OK? So OK, minus sign, I'll keep it out. Minus sign here, I'll keep. And 2s plus 1 minus uh, the numerator. So minus of minus, it becomes, so plus it becomes s squared plus s into differentiation of the denominator, right? 2s plus 5. 2s plus 5 is equal to 0. So this denominator gets multiplied with 0 and gets vanished. Okay. And yeah. So you can simplify it further. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here you have a minus sign and here you have a plus sign. That's okay. So minus of you can open up the brackets, 2s into s square, so 2s cube 
plus 10x square plus 12x plus s square plus 5s plus 6 plus um, 2s cube plus 2s square plus 5s square plus 5s is equal to 0. And probably you can even open up the bracket so you get minus 2s cube minus 10s square uh, minus 12s minus s square uh, minus 5s minus 6 plus 2s cube plus 2s square plus 5s square plus 5s is equal to 0. A uh, few terms are going to get cancelled. 2s cube minus 2s cube gets cancelled and uh, you can group uh, the like terms together, right? And when you simplify, you will get uh, 4s square plus 12s plus 6. Correct, sir. Okay. 4s square plus 12s plus 6. So this is your dk by ds, okay, which is equated to 0. So it's a second order equation. So you find out the roots of the second order equation. What do you get? Two roots, s1, comma 2. So s1, comma 2, you will get it as minus 0 0.633 comma minus 2.366 okay real roots negative real they are okay these are the roots of uh, the uh, dk by ds uh, uh, equation and these roots are nothing but breakaway points breakaway points okay now you have got two roots whether these two roots are valid or not uh, how are we going to check by checking its validity uh, by applying uh, rule number three okay so apply rule number three and check whether these two roots are falling in uh, the root local section or uh, they are falling in uh, nrl section okay can anyone confirm so go back to rule three Okay, where you had predicted uh, the existence of root locus, right? Minus one, zero, and zero, right? And you had predicted that this is NRL, RL, NRL, and RL. This is zero, minus one, minus two, and minus three, all right? Uh, what is the first root breakaway point minus 0 0.6 so where do you find minus 0 0.6 somewhere here so this is your breakaway point 1 ba1 okay and next you place the second breakaway point where is it getting placed it is getting placed at minus 2.3 minus 2.3 is somewhere here so this is your breakaway point two. Okay. So what is that you are observing? You are observing uh, that the two breakaway, breakaway points are getting located in valid section of root locus. Hence, both are valid breakaway points. Okay. This is how you check the validity of breakaway points. So sometimes what happens, you will get three breakaway points, but not necessarily that all three are valid. So validity, you can always check uh, on the basis of uh, the rule three. Okay, so rule three basically helps you in identifying the valid sections of root locus on the real axis. So these two are real breakaway points. So you can quickly cross check whether they are valid or invalid. In our case, both are valid breakaway points. All right, fine. So that's about rule six.
the calculation of breakaway point and validation of breakaway point. Any doubts till now? Fine. Rule seven. My favorite rule back up because it is RH criteria. Okay. Rule seven is RH criteria. Now for RH criteria, you want F of yes, right? You want the characteristic F of F of yes. So what do you get the characteristic equation as? Um, you have got the characteristic equation as uh, something like s square plus k s square plus s plus 2k s plus 6k is equal to 0. And if you rearrange the characteristic equation such that the equation is arranged in the descending powers of s so you will have a square common here so a square into 1 plus k plus again s is common s into uh, 2k plus 1 or 5k Okay. Here there is one more term. Okay, one more term. Three k s is equal to. There is one more term. So this becomes two k plus three k five k. Five k. So five k plus one into s um, plus the last term, which is six k, is equal to zero. So this is your characteristic equation. Uh, kept in uh, the RH criteria uh, requirement, right? You want your characteristic equation uh, in terms of descending powers of yes. Once you have the characteristic equation, you can create RH table S square S1 S to the power 0, okay? And you can start writing the coefficient starting from highest power of S, that is S square. So 1 plus K and 6K. And the missing term 5k plus 1 and 0. So, coefficient of s to the power 0, you will get it as 6k. Okay. For stability, you would want the first column entries uh, to have the same sign. All right. Now, since you have uh, the first column entries uh, in the form of k, what you have to do is uh, for stability. For stability um, from s to the power 0 row, you can say that 6k should be greater than 0 or k should be greater than 0. Okay, so that's your first condition. You will get it from s to the power 0 row, and from s to the power 1 row, you will get it something like 5k plus 1 should be greater than 0 or. Um, 5k should be greater than minus 1 or k should be greater than minus 1 by 5. Okay, the second condition you get. Okay. So minus 1 by 5 is uh, uh, minus 0 0.2. Okay. And also from S square row, a square row, uh, you can get something like 1 plus k should be greater than 0 or k should be greater than uh, minus 1, minus 1. Okay. Now, you have three conditions, k greater than, greater than 0, k greater than 0 0.2, k greater than 0 point, I mean, uh, point, I mean, minus 1. Okay, so all are kind of uh, greater than conditions in which you are going to consider the greatest one. 
Okay, in the sense for stability, you can say that k should be greater than zero because zero is greater than minus two, and it is also greater than minus one. So greatest among the lot you are supposed to pick that is greater than zero condition. So k should be greater than zero less than infinity because there has to be some some boundary, some measurable k value you are supposed to take. So this is the condition for um, stability greater than zero less than infinity okay now this gives the range of k value but you want to check whether the root locus intersects with the j omega axis or not so that can be checked by finding out the k marginal value okay now if you get your k marginal as positive you can say that root locus intersects with j omega axis on the other hand, if your k marginal is negative, you can say that root locus doesn't intersect. Okay. Now, uh, how will you find k marginal? K marginal. K marginal is a value of k which makes a particular row in your truth table as a row of zeros. So you cannot take s to the power zero row because you have only one element. Okay. Uh, you cannot have a square as your row of zeros because if you substitute, let's say, uh, just y yes, if you substitute um, yes, uh, k is equal to, let's say, um, minus one only, minus one only, what do you get? You will get one minus one, zero. So, first element you will get it as zero, uh, but your second element becomes minus six because. 6 into minus 1 is minus 6. So this becomes non zero element. So you cannot have a square as 0 row and you cannot have S naught as a row of 0. So only possibility is S to the power 1 row. That's because one of its element is always 0. Okay, is already 0. Now, which value of k makes the first term as 0? Obviously, the root of this particular function. What is the root of this? It is minus 0.2. So, k marginal is minus 0.2. Okay. Cross check. 5 into minus 0.2 is minus 1. Minus 1 plus 1 is 0. So, the moment when you substitute k value as minus 2, you will get the first element as 0. And the second element is naturally zero because of the characteristic equation. So s to the power one row is your row of zero. And the corresponding value of k is negative 0.2. So whenever k marginal, okay, when k marginal is negative, we would say that root locus doesn't intersect j omega axis. So the root locus doesn't intersect j omega axis. Okay. And if k marginal is positive, then only the root locus intersects with j omega axis. So it doesn't intersect with j omega. That means to say entire root locus. Entire root locus lies in RHS of yes plane. Entire root locus lies in RHS of yes plane. Okay. So this is the uh, thing about rule seven. Okay. There are two things. If you if you are not happy with the statement that if you feel that I'm uh, you know forcing you to believe this statement, so probably I can give you a small clue. Uh, this is your row of zeros, right? So you can create an auxiliary equation from the uh, above row. So your auxiliary equation a of s is equal to what is it? Uh, One plus k s squared um, plus six k which is equal to 0. Okay. 
and k is equal to minus 0.2 because you are supposed to substitute value of k as k marginal. So what do you get basically? Um, 1 plus k, so 1 minus 0.2, so that is 0 0.8 squared plus 6 into k. What is k? Uh, minus 0 0.2 is equal to 0. So this is 0 0.8 square um, minus uh, 1.2 is equal to 0. So find out the roots. You tell me. Are you getting imaginary roots or real roots? Can anyone quickly tell me? Point 0.8 square minus 1.2 or a square is 1.2 divided by 0.8. Okay. So if you see this ratio, this ratio is positive. So when you take out the roots, okay, or the square root, you will get plus or minus the real number, right? Under root 1.2 divided by 0.8. So 1.2 divided by 0.8 under root gives plus or minus 1.224. Okay. So there is no J term. What do you what do you mean by that? So the meaning of negative k marginal is that when you substitute negative k marginal in your auxiliary equation, uh, the roots of the auxiliary equation always going to be uh, the uh, real roots. When you say real roots, there is no imaginary crossover. To get imaginary crossover, you should get complex conjugate roots. Okay. Complex conjugate roots. Okay. So that's the reason. Okay. This you need not show in your exam. The statement itself you can uh, fill here because if k marginal is negative, you will get real root. But in order to get crossover, you must have the imaginary roots. Okay. So imaginary roots you will get only when k marginal is positive. Okay. So from rule 7, you can say that the root locus uh, never intersects the j omega axis. That means to say the entire root locus uh, lies in left hand side of yes here. Okay. Rule 8. Rule 8 is about angle of arrival and departure. Okay. Rule 8 is about angle of arrival and departure. But rule 8 is applicable. Applicable to only complex conjugate. On, on, uh, it is applicable to only complex conjugate pole or zero. But if you look at your transfer function, you don't have any complex rules, right? You have real rules. So rule eight is not applicable to the given problem. So rule eight is ruled out. Okay. So that's it. So that is about the calculation of uh, the various factors associated with the root locus okay now you have to plot the root locus okay now remember one thing root locus needs to be plotted uh, on a linear graph okay linear graph as in this type of graph your normal ordinary graph so this is your linear graph which is also called as one is to one graph so root locus is plotted on a linear graph and Bode plot is plotted on a semi long graph. Okay, semi long graph. So you need a graph sheet in order to practice root locus problems. Okay, so whenever the time permits, probably you can buy a graph sheet. Okay, and if the current situation doesn't permit you to buy a graph sheet, doesn't matter. You can create a, create your own graph sheet, right? By selecting one is to one scale. Okay, so you cannot give any reasons that I did not get any graph sheet. 
as though I have a graph sheet over here. No, one is to one scale you can draw. Okay, fine. So you draw a custom made graph sheet. Okay, select uniform scale, say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I also have a scale, so probably I can use that so that I can get a better graph. Okay, so this is your J1, J2, J3, minus J1, minus J2, minus J3, minus J4, and this is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. Okay, and you can mark uh, the poles and zeros. Okay, so you have a zero at origin. And then you have a zero at minus one. Okay. Sorry, four, four. Sorry, you have a four at origin and four at minus one. And then you will have a zero at minus two. And also you are having a zero at minus three. Okay. So zeros are marked with circles, and x represents. Done. Pole zero plot I have drawn. Okay, I have drawn the pole zero plot. Okay. Once you are done with pole zero plot, what you have to do is, um, okay, you don't have to draw angle of uh, asymptotes and uh, decentroid, right? Because uh, you did not get any centroid and angle of asymptotes, so you can just uh, uh, omit uh, rule uh, four and rule five. Now we are left with the breakaway points. Okay, you got breakaway points as minus 0 0.6 and minus uh, 2.3. Okay, so mark the breakaway points. Minus 0 0.6 is somewhere here. Okay, so what I will do, I will draw something like this and I will say breakaway point 1, which is equal to minus 0. 6, 3. And my second breakaway point is at minus 2.3. So 2 is here, 2.3 is somewhere here. Like this I will mark and I will say breakaway point 2 which is located at minus 2.36. Okay, done. Okay, so did you mark? Once you are done with the marking, okay, what you can do is you can plot the root locus, root locus. Okay. Now, to plot the root locus, you first, you must first know um, what are the RL sections of the root locus and NRL sections of the root locus. So, what you can do is you can refer um, rule number three to identify NRL and RL section. So, this is your NRL section and this is your RL section. Okay. So, so this small section is RL and this is NRL, okay, and this is also your RL section, okay, NRL, RL, NRL, R. This is how you are supposed to mark, okay. Once you are done with the marking, okay, what I will do, I will probably try to draw a bigger diagram so that it adds more clarity. Okay. Okay. You consider this diagram. 
for the representation purpose okay, because I don't want to populate this diagram with uh, too many lines and circles. Okay, so fresh diagram I will draw to plot the root row. So I have a pole at origin, then at minus one, zero, minus two, and one more zero at minus three. Okay. This is my NRL, RL, NRL, RL. Okay. Fine. My breakaway point, one breakaway point here, and another breakaway point at minus 2.3, that is here. Okay. Now, this part is very crucial. In Step two, we mentioned that the root locus branch will start from a pole and terminates at a zero. So where are the poles? You have a pole at origin and you have a pole at negative one. So from these two locations, the root locus branch will emerge out. Okay. So let me start with the pole which is placed at origin. Okay. Now you have a pole here. Okay, from this location, one root locus branch will start. The second lo root locus branch will start from minus one. Okay, let's say, let us consider the first branch, okay, which is located at uh, zero or origin. Okay. Now, where it should move? Okay, it starts from here, correct. Now, where it should move? The branch. Can it move in the right hand direction? Can it move along the positive real axis? Or can it move along the negative real axis? That is what I am trying to ask you. Who will help me out? The rule 3 is going to help us out. In rule 3, you had predicted that the entire positive real axis is not the part of root locus. So, the branch which is starting from origin cannot move along the positive real axis because the entire positive real axis is no root locus zone. If this is no root locus zone, you cannot have the movement in the no root locus zone. So your root locus branch should move in the left hand side region that is left bound. Okay. So this is how your root locus branch is going to move okay now the root locus branch can move in this direction because between 0 and minus 1 you have the valid section okay so this is how we predict the movement of root locus branch so you don't have to physically find the n number of roots you can directly apply rule 3 and you can check whether the root locus moving in right hand side direction or left hand side direction fine so that's about the first root locus branch at the same time you have one more one more root locus branch starting from minus one now okay fine it starts from minus one and it should move in which direction should it move on right hand side direction that is towards origin or should it move towards minus two location can anyone tell me it should move towards uh, the origin. That's because between minus one and origin, you have a valid root locus. Okay. The root locus branch cannot move between minus one and minus two because between minus one and minus two, you have NRL section. So by identifying RL and NRL section, one can predict the movement of root locus okay so what happens is that the second branch starts from minus one and it moves in the right hand side okay so it moves in the right hand side direction okay so what is happening the two branches are moving okay and at one particular point called as the breakaway point breakaway point 
they are meeting together. At the breakaway point, the two branches of the root locus meets, meets, okay, and go away. The two branches will meet at the breakaway point, and where will they go? They should go away, right? So, one branch will go in the upward direction. The one branch will go in the upward direction. The okay, let me put the arrow for the movement of the one branch, and the other branch will go in the downward direction. Downward direction. So you have the two branch movement. One branch will move in the upward direction, another branch will move in the downward direction. Now can they cut the j omega axis? They cannot cut the j omega axis because in rule 7, we saw that k marginal was negative. So whenever you get k marginal as negative, you can say that there is no uh, crossover with j omega axis. So after, you know, breaking away, the entire root locus plot lies in left-hand side of the yes plane. Okay. Now, you have a second breakaway point here. So what happens at this breakaway point is that the upper root locus branch will move something like this. And the lower root locus branch will move this symmetry there. Okay. It moves uh, in the same path because root locus is always symmetrical about real axis. Okay, so it moves in this direction. Moves in this direction. Okay. Now, at the second breakaway point, the two branches are meeting together. Okay. Remember one thing: we have obtained two valid breakaway points. After breaking away, they are meeting again at the second breakaway point. After meeting at this breakaway point, what will happen in the second rule, we had predicted that two branches will start from both and the branches will terminate at zeros. So after meeting at this breakaway point, one branch will move in this direction and it will terminate at an available zero. The remaining branch will move in the right hand side direction and it is going to terminate at the available zero because there are two zeros one is located at minus two and one more is located at minus three so both the branches are going to eventually terminate at the available zero location okay so this is a standard problem so whenever you have p is equal to z you get circular root locus plot root locus plot okay so while drawing uh, what you have to do is you have to measure the distance between the two breakaway points. Okay, so the distance between the two, two breakaway points is basically the diameter of the circle. This is your circle diameter. Okay, so accordingly, using the compass, you can draw a proper root locus plot. So it gives kind of circular shape. Okay, so this is your root locus plot. Okay, uh, it takes some two to three plot problems to understand. Okay, because when you draw the root locus, so many questions will come into mind. Why it should be left bound? Why not right bound? Why it should move on the left hand side? Why not on the right hand side? Etc. etc. So I would suggest you to watch this video at least uh, you know, three to four times uh, before coming to the second class. Okay. Um, the calculation part you will not find any difficulty. Okay. The construction part because each video length is about 50 minutes and I'm asking you to watch for four, four to five times. So that's about three hours. Okay, no, no, don't take it in that way. Okay, don't take the literal meaning. Uh, only the construction part, you uh, please rehearse. All right. The calculation part is very easy. If you are in sixth semester, you can easily handle the calculation part. But this is the intellectual part. Okay, so this part you have to little practice. Okay. 
So what I'll do, I will uh, stop uh, the problem over here. Okay. And in the next class, let me continue. Okay. Can anyone tell me about the stability from the plot? Can you say the system is stable? The system is absolutely stable because the entire root locus plot is found on left hand side of the yes plane. So whenever you have the roots on left hand side of the yes plane, you can say that the system is absolutely stable. Okay. So the given system is stable for all positive values of k. I mean, for all values of k. Okay. So it's an absolutely stable system. Thank you.